Uh, today the first seminar of our God and Country Seminar Series. It's going to be a, a series of five seminars. Today we'll be talking about the American story. We're going to talk about the history of the country and how the word history tells the whole story. It's his story. It's, that, the, it's his story about this country. We're going to talk about that today. Uh, uh, the next month we're going to talk about the miracles and that have been documented in the life of this country. So I'm going to be sharing all the miracles and some of them are really some from Brooklyn and so that's my favorite one but a whole bunch of miracles that happened in the life of the country. We'll talk about that next month. April we're going to talk about the faith of our founders. Were they a bunch of agnostics and deists or were they actually real Bible believing Christians? Uh, then May 1st we're going to look at our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, uh, our Constitution, uh, the Articles of Confederation, uh, the Northwest Ordinance, the documents that are really the foundation of this, this government. And then the last session in June, uh, we talk about the biblical principles for good government. And uh, uh, so for everybody who survives it, if we make four out of five seminars, we'll give you a big certificate. That and 250 you can get on the subway in, 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 in the city. But, but just to have something there, you know, to, to show it. So, so that, that's where we're going, okay? So it, it's good. I mean, this is a good-sized class. We've got about 15 people. It's good so we can go crazy. But if we get if it gets on Facebook, that will be fine. But if not, it's on Facebook. It is. Huh? It's on Facebook. It's on Facebook? Okay, good. Yeah, sometime later. Hi, everybody uh, on Facebook. <laughs> Wish you were here. But, oh, well. All right. So, so today's schedule. Here's what today's going to look like. 9.30 to 10, we worship. We just did that. 10 o'clock, this session one, we're going to talk about discovery of the, and colonial America, that period, that time period. Uh, second session, we'll be, we'll talk about the 18th century, then we'll break for lunch, 1 o'clock, a little bit of worship, 1.30 session, the 19th century, uh, 1.30, 2.30, then the 20th century, 20, uh, uh, 2.30, 3.30, and then 3.30 to 4, we open discussion, prayer, and close, okay? And if anybody has to leave, like I said, I was, one or two of you said that you have to leave before then, just pick up and, and go. You know, we, we won't be offended uh, at all. All right? Make sense? All right. Now, oh, the best part about it is here. Uh, Steve, you're not the best part. And Mike. You guys get your own. Thank you. You guys get your own book. Oh, thank you. There's three more, that's it. Three more. We should have enough. Okay. Anybody on Facebook, if you want to get the notes, shoot me an email and I will email you all the notes. Uh, for Facebook. Okay. Okay, everybody missing? No? All right. Everybody got one? You okay. Got two extra. Okay, got two extras. Okay. We All should right. have TV tables. Because right. the, the things that we go through, if I don't get a chance to go through them, you'll have them in your notes there as, as well. You'll, you'll have them in your notes. Okay. So we're going to start with session one. First thing, actually, before we get into the history of the country, one thing I, I did want to cover first is how many of you know that the... Uh, the reporting that we get about our history is not always true. <laughs> really? Shocked. Shocked. So, so I, I want you to be able to identify what's true and what's not true and understand how, how it works. Uh, oh, first of all, let's talk about why this course is so important. All right. Uh, President Woodrow Wilson, who wasn't exactly a conservative, he was like a socialist. Mm. But even he said, we're trying to do a futile thing if we do not know where we came from or what we have been about. Now, that's one of my least favorite presidents, one of my most favorite presidents. We've got to teach history based not on what is in fashion, but what's important. If we forget what we did, we won't know who we are. I'm warning of an eradication of the American memory that could result, ultimately, in an erosion of the American spirit, Ronald Reagan. And aren't, aren't we seeing that even now? Yes. An erosion of the yes. American spirit. Yep. That's, that's why we're here today. 
That's why you guys are here, are here at, 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 as well. All right. So now we're going to talk about uh, re revisionism. How to really uh, identify revisionist history. These are some of the methods that we hear reporting that's not accurate. Uh, whoops. Revisionist history caused generations to believe lies. Modern historians characterize our founders as atheists, agnostics, and deists. Here's that idea. One method they use is what they call post-structuralism. This is when there's no objective truth or structure. There's no transcendent values. Everyone is entitled to their truth. You've heard that before? <laughs> you, you got your truth and I've got my truth. And you have no right to tell me what my truth is. All right? That's a lie. There's only one truth, right? His name is... Jesus, amen. Exactly. Now that's what they call situational ethics. Under these particular situations, uh, it it could be true. Now understand this. This is why they, the left, sees everything that they do as being legitimate, because the situation means getting rid of Donald Trump, who is in their minds evil. So therefore, in that situation. Anything is acceptable. That's a classic example of situational ethics. You say, how could people say things like that and lie about that and do the things that they're doing without any sense of, of conscience? Why? Because in their minds, whatever they, the ends justifies the means. It's situational ethics. That's what they, they're talking about there. The value, and I hit the other thing, the value of the individual and individual rights is superseded by group identity. If you look at our founding documents and when we talk about that, the Declaration and the Bill of Rights, our rights are all directed toward the individual. There are no rights for any groups. All right? It's all about the individual. It's all about issues of the heart. Now, the thing is this. This is all based on an evolutionist worldview. That's why, for example, the left discounts our Constitution they discount our founders because in their minds, we have evolved. And we're now an enlightened people. And in their mind, the founders, they say, oh, they did good with their time for the knowledge that they had. But now we have much more knowledge. We've evolved. We don't need those old rules anymore. So again, situational ethics, the evolutionist worldview. The problem with that is that pride. We know that the Bible says that pride comes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. So the thing is, that's the problem with the left. They're all about <laughs> arrogance and ignorance. You know, and, uh, but in their own minds, they know better than us because we're old-fashioned. We still believe in that Bible. right? But they're now enlightened. So you, know, you understand that's where they're coming from that helps you not get so frustrated. When, when you realize how come we, we can't make make sense there, right? Modernism. Modernism examines historical events and evaluates them according to modern standards. Separates history from its cultural context and settings. All right, you can't evaluate past si situations with modern standards. Uh, I'll give you one example. Everybody, now they're knocking down all the monuments, right? Mm -hmm. They're knocking down Jefferson because, because Je Jefferson had slaves, right? But they never tell you that in, a, in colonial America then, it was actually illegal to free the slaves because the King of England declared that we cannot liberate the slaves. It was against the law to liberate slaves. So Jefferson, though he had slaves, in a sense he had no choice. And he had problems with slavery as well. Even though he, like a lot of our founders did, they did have slaves. But it, they were, it was illegal. It was illegal to give them freedom at, at that point. All right. That's just one example of how you can't measure past events by common standards. Because they were in a whole different cultural mindset there. All right. Uh, the next one is... Academic collectivism, a reliance on peer review as a standard for historical truth rather than reference to original sources. All right. That's basically when all the experts come together and they agree 
This is the way it is. Without any reference to evidence or documentation, I have a book in my office called The Godless Constitution. It's a whole book about the Godless Constitution. And at the back page, it's basically it says, we have dispensed with footnotes and references because for simplicity reasons or whatever, a bunch of baloney and, and all that. The bottom line is they made a whole big thick book without any reference to any evidence whatsoever. But it's all what the experts come together and they said that our constitution is godless. So because they all agree on it, it must be so. All right, so that's what you need to, to look out for. Academic collectivism. And then the, the fourth one here is deconstructionism. Examines history with an emphasis and an intentional effort to magnify the negatives and minimize or completely ignore the positive effects or selected issues of the historical subjects examined in order to advance a political agenda. Right? That's when you only get half the news. Mm -hmm. they, they only give you the bad news or what they want to sh criticize mm -hmm. to advance their own agenda. They don't give you the whole thing, like that example with, with, with Jefferson, you know. That's just w one example, that he had slaves. They don't tell you that it was illegal to free them. Or there's so many other things there that they just emphasize the positives. Uh, I, we're we're going to talk about this when we talk about uh, Columbus, because that's a real good example of that as well. All right, but the point is this. I, even as we go through the studies, I want you just to be aware of, of the reports that you hear and ask yourself if what you're hearing, are they practicing any of this stuff? And if they are, you know it's fake news, all right? So we need to understand that. We need to teach our people that. Most of the stuff that I get, by the way, this is a David Barton teaching mm -hmm. uh, from Wall Builders. Most of the stuff I share with you is gonna be coming from David Barton's teachings, because he's been my mentor for years. Uh, so I, I claim I don't have anything original. It's all coming from, from, from somewhere. Most of it is from David Barton stuff. So if you want to know more about any of this stuff, go on to his website, go on to YouTube, look up David Barton, and you, you can look up uh, revisionism or, or what have you, and you get m more information on that. All right, moving right along. Uh, okay, Let, let's talk about, all right, that's about, in general, about, about history. Let's talk about the, dis the age of discovery. Uh, the age of discovery, America was, we know, Christopher Columbus was the guy that discovered the, the, the Western Hemisphere, right? But how many of you know that there's been fake news concerning Christopher Columbus, uh, why why he did why he discovered America and all that? Uh, what what can anybody tell me what you heard? What what why did you learn Columbus came and discovered uh, the Western world? Find a trade route to the east. Okay, okay. Find a trade route to the east. Anything for gold, else? For gold and riches. For, for gold. For the glory of God. Well, you, yeah, you, you. Well, to him right. personally. Right, right, okay. But the point is this: a trade route. You know, uh, you want to find uh, and a lot of stuff. But in, instead of listening to the history books that were written mm. by people who wrote about Columbus, why don't we just read what Columbus, Columbus said? Columbus wrote, yeah. Mm. What he said. And basically, this was his journal, mm. that he kept a journal there. And, and this is what he said, and I put it in your notes, and I'm going to read it to you right out of here. He said, and this is his journal, quote, It was the Lord who put it into my mind. I could feel his hand upon me, the fact that it would be possible to sail from here to the Indies. All who heard of my project rejected it with laughter, ridiculing me. There's no question that the inspiration was from the Holy Spirit because he comforted me with rays of marvelous inspiration from the Holy Scriptures. I'm a most unworthy sinner. I have cried out to the Lord for grace and mercy, and they have covered me completely. I have found the sweetest consolation since I made it my whole purpose to enjoy his marvelous presence. For the execution of the journey to the Indies, I did not make use of intelligence, mathematics, or maps. It is simply the fulfillment of what Isaiah had prophesied. No one should fear to undertake any task in the name of our Savior, if it is just and if the intention is purely for His holy service. 
There you go. That's why he came. The working out of all things has been assigned each to each person by our Lord. But it all happens according to his sovereign will. Even though he gives advice, he lacks nothing that it is in the power of men to give him. Oh, what a gracious Lord who desires that people should perform for him those things for which he holds himself responsible. Day and night, moment by moment, everyone should express their most devoted gratitude to him. That's why Columbus came to America. Because he felt led by God through the Holy Scriptures, by through the Holy Spirit. It, it, was, it was a God thing. And people don't realize that most of our explorers were missionary explorers. They, they had the sense to spread the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world. And they were motivated by that. We hear the thing about Columbus wanting the gold. Uh, you know why Columbus wanted the gold? It wasn't a selfish thing. You have to understand, at that time, the Ottoman Empire, the, 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 the Muslims, had taken over most of all Europe, southern Europe at that point. At that point, they had taken over uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Spain just got rid of them. They, 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 the, the, uh, uh, they, they had conquered Spain. Spain just got rid of them. But they were still fighting to liberate much of the Mediterranean area from the Muslims uh, there. He wanted the goal to finance the, uh, Spain's war to take back Jerusalem from the Muslims because they needed financing to take it back. So, you know, we all hear about the Crusades, right? How terrible the Crusades were mm -hmm. and, and all that. I think there was like, uh, I forgot how many Crusades there were, but there was a lot more of the Muslim wars upon Christianity, Christian uh, Europe at that point, then the crusade was basically to take it back. Was to take back the land for, for Christ. So if we get a bad rap about the crusade, they, they did a lot of horrendous things during the crusade. I'm not uh, excusing them. But what I'm saying is that was a reaction to the, the Muslim conquest of Europe. And nobody talks about what the Muslims did in, in all of Europe. Again, seeing history in its full context. That's what I think. Otherwise, you just get half the picture. That was the Crusades. We were terrible. You only get half of it. And we have to realize there's a lot more to it than that. And Christopher Columbus, uh, uh, he, he, yes, he wanted the gold. Uh, his, uh, uh, another thing, how many of you heard that they, 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 they slaughtered the Indians, you know, when they, when, when they came to uh, 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 El Salvador? He, he, he named the first land he, he came to. He, ho he named it El Salvador, it means Holy Savior. That was the place he named it. Now understand this, uh, when, he, when he landed, he came, uh, uh, he met the, the, the Taino Indians at that point, when he faith came across. The Taino Indians were a very friendly, loving tribe. He even spoke about how gracious these people were, and how good these people were, and they all got along really, really well. In fact, they got along so well, that he said, you know what, uh, I, I'm gonna, we're going to go back to Europe, more supplies, bring back more people, and we'll come back. So that was going to be his second trip. Uh, I'd say we're leaving. Well, one of the ships got damaged, uh, so they had to leave some of the people there, some of his own people there, the, the crew there. So they, they got there. They, they made a settlement. The, the Spaniards did. They made a settlement there uh, among the, the, the Tainos in El Salvador. Uh, but there was a problem. There was another tribe that lived a little bit further away that the Taino Indians told Columbus about, but he didn't pay attention to them. Uh, the problem with this tribe was not so friendly. Uh, this tribe was, was called the, 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 the Caribs. And from the Caribs, you get the word cannib, cannibalism. Mm -hmm. So this tribe were a bunch of cannibals. So what happened then, when uh, Columbus went back to Europe, he left some of his guys there in the settlement. The, the, the Caribs conquered them, killed all of them, ate all of them, and they took some of the Taino women captive. And uh, when Christopher Columbus came back on his second journey, 
he came back and he found his men pieces in pieces, literally found remains of the men that, that he left there. And when they, at that point, they went to the Carib uh, uh, village and they found there were like 50 huts there. They had all Taino women in them. They were alive, the, the Taino women. And they asked the Taino women, you know, what, what was going on, what happened? The Taino women told them they came and they ate all their men uh, and they kept the women alive so the women can have babies for them and then they would eat the babies. Oh. This was their lifestyle. This was the way they lived, because they they the way was they liked babies and uh, I forget. Oh, anyway, they had us. I guess that was a delicacy. So they kept the Taino women uh, to have to uh, have babies for them, and they they would eat them. So Columbus then then Columbus went after. At that point, he went after the Caribs. Number one to free the Taino women and to get rid of the cannibals that were in El Salvador, all right? So you don't hear that. All you hear is that Columbus went to kill all the Indians. You, 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 you don't hear that. Even when, when he went back on his second trip to Europe, he even brought some of the Indians with him to show the king and to introduce them and, and to do that. So he had good goodwill. Yeah, as, it, as the things went on, things got messy and things didn't happen that were very good or, or holy. Uh, but we need to understand the whole context of the whole thing. Everything that we've heard about Columbus is not true. Yes, Judy. Do you have a reference for that, like the history with the cannibals and the tribes and whatever? That came from David Barton's book, American History. Okay. I, I believe that. So you want to pick up. B A R T O N. Excuse me. B A R T O N Barton. B A R T O N. B A R T O N. Okay. B -A -R -T -O -N. Mm. Yeah. That that came, that came his book. Either that or. Uh, 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 Marshall's book uh, from *Sea to Signing Sea* and uh, *The Delight and the Glory*, but I think it was from David Barton's book. Thank you. Oh. Right. Okay. Yeah. Actually. Okay. All right. All right. So that's the the colonial. That's the age of discovery, right? Uh, colonial general tells why he came. We just read that. Uh, let's talk about the the, the next thing now. Uh, the the 1620. Uh, the Europeans come, the uh, uh, pilgrims come to, to New England. First, before that, there was a settlement they tried in Virginia, uh, and that settlement didn't work out too well because that first settlement, uh, was, there were a lot of gentlemen and guys who just wanted to make gold, and, and they didn't know how to work, they didn't know how to do anything, so that settlement didn't work out very well. Uh, the settlement in New England, 1620, was brought on by the uh, uh, pilgrims that came here. Uh, wh wh why did the pilgrims come? Wh why, why were you taught the pilgrims came here? Freedom of worship. Excuse me? Freedom of worship. Okay, that's what we were taught, right? <clears throat> no, that's not true. <laughs> they had freedom of worship already in Holland. They left England and went to Holland for freedom of worship. They lived in Holland for 12 years but they realized that Holland was too ungodly and they decided they didn't want their children to be raised up in that culture. So they wanted to find a place that they could call their own where they wouldn't be contaminated by the world systems and they would also be able to spread the gospel as well. So that's why they sailed uh, uh, to Virginia at that point. And, and well, let's look and see again. That's what I'm saying. Instead of listening to what somebody reports about it, let's see what they said. What happened was they, they were supposed to land in, in, in Virginia area, but they, the weather knocked them off toward New England. And when they got off Cape Cod, they didn't really have a contract for that area from the king. So they had to establish their own contract. So what they did was this is the first time in world history that people got together to mutually agree on governing themselves and putting it on paper. First time in world history this ever happened. Mm -hmm. It's called the, the Mayflower Compact. On November 11, 1620, needing to maintain order and establish a civil society, while they waited for this new patent, the adult male passengers signed the Mayflower Compact. This is what they said. In the name of God, amen. 
we whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our great sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., etc., having undertaken his, why they came, for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. That's why they came to America, for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian religion. That's why they said they came. And our public schools teaching us they came because they wanted religious freedom. That was a part of it. But they don't tell you they came here for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Again, this isn't somebody's opinion. This is original source documentation. Whenever you study history, you want to go to original source documentation. Don't buy what somebody says about it. Go back to the original source. Okay? Make sense? All right. So, as they were settling in a few years later, uh, they decided, the few colonies that, that met there in New England, they decided they better come together and make some kind of agreement amongst themselves. So they came up with the, the New England Confederation, which was the first time that several uh, colonies came together to form some type of a union. 1643, the four separate colonies of Massachusetts Bay, Plymouth Plantation, Connecticut, and New Haven agreed to form an association known as the New England Confederation. This was the first attempt to unite several colonies in mutual cooperation, such as later happened with the 13 colonies during the American War for Independence. The governing document for that confederation clearly states the Christian nature of the early statements. Quote, Whereas we all came into these parts of America with one and the same end and aim, namely to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel and purity and peace. The said united colonies do enter into a firm and perpetual league of friendship for preserving and propagating the truth and liberties of the gospel and for their own mutual safety and welfare. That's why they first came, and that's why they were first. So everything was basically God-centered with our founders when, 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 they, when they first came here. Amen? All right, moving right along. Uh, public schools. This is now when they came together and they set up, they, they knew that they had to keep their people educated. They need to do that. So they actually came up with the first public school law. The first public school law was actually called the Old Satan Deluder Act. <laughs> All right? Now, uh, and here's, here's what it says. This was the first law concerning public education in America. Really? It said, okay. it, it being one chief project of that old deluder Satan to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures as in former times keeping them in an unknown tongue so in these later times, by persuading from the use of tongues, that so at least the true sense and meaning of the original might be clouded by false glosses. See, that's the original spelling. That's why it's spelled differently. Original spelling. Clouded by false glosses of, of saint-seeming deceivers. Anybody know any saint-seeming deceivers? Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, and that learning may not be buried in the graves of our forefathers in church and commonwealth, the Lord assisting our endeavors. It is therefore ordered by this court and authority thereof that every township in this jurisdiction, after the Lord has increased them to a number of 50 householders, shall then forthwith appoint one within their town to teach all such children as shall resort to him to write and read, whose wages shall be paid either by the parents or masters, masters of such children, or by the inhabitants in general, by way of supply, as the major part of those that order the credentials of the town hall shall appoint, provided that those which send their children be not oppressed by paying much more than they can have them taught for in other towns. That's called capitalism. All right? And two, 
It is further ordered that where any town shall increase to the number of 100 families or householders, they shall set up a grammar school, the masters thereof being able to instruct youth so far as they may be fitted for the university. And if any town neglect the performance hereof above, one year then every such town shall pay five pounds per annum to the next such school till they shall perform this order, the laws and liberties of Massachusetts in 1647. All right, so the first, understand why they made this the, the, the law, because they didn't want their people to be deluded by Satan. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, it said the way to keep our people not deluded by Satan is to teach them to read and read the Bible. If they can read and the Bible, they'll be less likely to be deluded by Satan. So at any town of 50 people or more, you're going to have to pay a teacher basically to teach your, your kids. And again, for the people, so that if it's too much for the people, if they can get it so, somewhere else less expensive, let them get it. So again, that's capitalism. All right? It, it's not, you know, we'll just have all our money and divide it all, you know, equally. So understand that's the first public law in the United States uh, concerning our children and public education. Good one, right? Mm. We need laws like that today. Uh, yeah. Amen. I'd love to see a new Satan Deluder Act. Yeah. Um, uh, the same principle. Our kids are being deluded by Satan today. Right? All right. Moving right. 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 right along. Okay, so that, that that's there. Let's go into uh, the 18th century now. Uh, why did the colonists break away from England? Why did they break away from England? What did what were you taught? Huh? They taxation without representation. Right? Taxation without representation, right? Uh, today, most Americans are taught that the reason America broke from England was because of taxation without representation. But the truth is, uh, is that that was only 17th of 27 reasons noted in the Declaration of Independence. There were many other issues. Uh, let's see if I got my notes here right. Uh, there were religious issues. In 1762, the king vetoed the charter for America's first missionary society. Mm -hmm. He also suppressed other religious freedoms and even prevented Americans from printing an English language Bible. How did Americans respond? They took action. Almost unknown today is the fact that the Declaration signers, such as Samuel Adams and Charles Carroll, cited religious freedom as the reason they became involved in the American Revolution, right? That was only one reason, taxation without representation, of 27 uh, reasons why they, they uh, rebelled against England. Moral issues. The greatest moral issue of that day was slavery. And after several of the American colonies moved toward abolishing slavery in 1773, the king in 1774 vetoed those anti-slavery laws and continued slavery in America. Okay? So you see, even there, even there, slavery was, was, was an issue, particularly in the northern colonies. The northern colonies really believed that slavery was immoral. All right? And, they, and many of the colonies then uh, uh, outlawed slavery. But at that point, they were still under the king of England, and he vetoed those laws so that they couldn't outlaw slavery. So slavery un during that time was still legal in all the 13 colonies, even though several of them didn't want it. It was a moral issue. That was one of the reasons for the uh, Declaration of, of Independence. Patrick Henry reports on his own actions before and during the War for Independence, and he said hey, this is from his own, again, his own reporting. This is his own report. In 1765, he said this, it was a, a letter to somebody, I forget who, but it says, uh, uh, the within resolutions passed the House of Burgesses in May 1765. They formed the first opposition to the Stamp Act and the scheme of taxing America by the British Parliament. All the colonies, either through fear or want of opportunity to form an opposition, or from influence of some kind or other, had remained silent. I had been for the first time elected, now this is him talking, I had been for the first time elected a Burgess a few days before, was young, 
inexperienced, unacquainted with the forms of the house and the members that composed it, finding the men of weight averse to opposition and the commencement of the tax at hand, and that no person was likely to step forth, I determined to venture, and alone, unadvised and unassisted, on a blank leaf of an old law book, wrote the within. Upon offering them to the house, violent debates ensued. Many threats were uttered, and much abuse cast on me by the party for submission. After a long and warm contest, the resolutions passed by a very small majority, perhaps of one or two only. The alarm spread throughout America with astonishing quickness, and the ministerial party was overwhelmed. The ministerial party was the Tories. That was what we would call today the establishment. Mm -hmm. right, the ministerial party, they were overwhelmed. The great point of resistance to British taxation was universally established in the colonies. This brought on the war which finally separated the two countries and gave independence to ours. Whether this will prove a blessing or a curse, this is important now, whether this will prove a blessing or a curse will depend upon the use our people make of the blessings which a gracious God hath bestowed on us. If they are wise, they will be great and happy. If they are of contrary character, they will be miserable, they will be miserable. Righteousness alone can exalt them as a nation. Reader, whoever thou art, remember this, and thy sphere, practice virtue thyself, and encourage it in others. Patrick Henry. All right? So this is what was going on in our history. This is the story. This is why I said the story of America is his story. It, it's all his story. Okay? There. All right. I'm uh, moving right along here. Uh, do, do, do. All right. Uh, uh, one thing that that uh, uh, one, one quote I did was Sam Adams. Did I put that one here. Yeah, yeah. Sam Adams quote. I, I love this good. one. That's good. Yeah. Huh? That's good. I love this one. It doesn't yeah. take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority, king we are. on setting brush fires <laughs> of freedom in the minds of men. Is that us? Can I use be arrested that. for saying that? <laughs> Setting fires. <laughs> that, that, that's got to be us, all right? That 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 minority, uh, irate, tireless, setting uh, uh, setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. That's why we're here. Amen. All right, moving right along. Let's see if I do do get into session two. Do we get into session two yet? Oh, we got we got right to go. Uh, Okay, I'm going to be moving right along here. Oh, okay, moving right along. Okay. All right. All right, so these are now, I gave you all the notes. You, you have all the notes. If I go over some things here quick, you, you have the stuff in the notes better. All right, these are the things that kind of led up to, to the revolution. Uh, the town, the Townshend Act, uh, the King taxed many items. Sam Adams spoke that it was a violation of their natural and constitutional rights. The local legislature rejected it and boycotted the products. The king sent troops then to Boston to show force, but it just made the colonists that much more angry and set on a path to throw off tyrannical rule. All right, so pressures were coming down on them. They were taxing everything. Our people were getting upset. And the, the more that the king tried to do to restrict us, to put us down, with the American spirit, that just got us more fired up. That just got us more angry. That, that, that is the American spirit, amen? We, we, we don't give in mm. to tyranny. And that must not change. That must not change. All right. Then on March 5th, 1770, the Battle of King Street, an altercation between colonists and British troops, now known as the Boston Massacre, mm. saw British troops fire into a crowd of rock-throwing protesters, killing five and wounding several others. Crispus Attucks, an African-American Indian, was regarded as the first blood to be spilled in the cause of liberty. Curtis, did you know that? Yes. First, the first man that gave his life for liberty was an African American. Yeah. You would never know it. They didn't teach <laughs> no, it out in public school. No, they didn't. They didn't teach that in public school. I know. That's the problem with, with even black history. Mm -hmm. They teach black history only from the 1960s on. Yep. They don't teach you the 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 the, the role that black Americans played in the life of this nation. 
going way back it's the Revolutionary War. You know, you, you know in fact, uh, make sure you take that book. I have a book out there for you on the table called America Black and White, and it's really about 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 all this kind of stuff that, that we haven't been taught. But that that was there. All right, moving right along. Then, then the committees for correspondence were established uh, after that. Reverend Jonathan Mayhew initiated the idea of the committees for correspondence, circular letters to the colonies to keep each one informed on the issues affecting all the colonies. Mayhew died before it could be realized, but Sam Adams followed through and made it happen. This was basically our first uh, text message system. <laughs> you know, our first social media. Uh, was the committees for correspondence when they set up committees to correspond and report mm -hmm. on what was going on so everyone will be kept abreast of what's going on in the other colonies. That's why Patrick Henry spoke about what was going on in New England even though it wasn't going on in Virginia then at, at, at that point. But, uh, but he knew that it, that it was coming their, their way. Uh, then we had the Boston Tea Party. An act of mercy, tea, again, People don't understand what happened to the Boston Tea Party. This was an act of mercy for the captain, Joseph Roch, who would not be allowed to return to England with his cargo of tea without reprisals from the king. So colonists devised a plan to throw the tea overboard. In this way, they would be faithful to maintaining their boycott, and the captain could return without his cargo of tea. A win-win situation. Now, at that time, what was happening, the, the king... Was, was sending stuff to Boston, but Boston they were boycotting the king's uh, stuff because uh, because he was taxing everything. So they were boycotting everything. They didn't want to buy anything. The, but then all of a sudden, this, this, the ship comes over with tea, and the captain is ordered that he needs to sell the tea to, to the uh, colonists, and the colonists aren't going to buy it. So he can't go back to England with a whole load of tea because the king will throw him in prison or something like that because he failed his mission. So they got together with the colonists, the captain did. The captain said, hey, I got a problem. I got a whole shipload of tea. I can't go back to England with it. And I know you guys are going to buy it. What do I do? So they came up with the idea of throwing it overboard. This way they don't have to buy it. And he doesn't have to retake and go back with an empty ship. <laughs> they didn't do that, right? So, that so with the disguise as in Indians, or huh? Right. Was yeah, they disguise as Indians. Yeah, they decided to disguise as Indians just to. Uh, 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 yeah, throw them all. Yeah, throw them all. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> all right. Then you had what they called the Coercive Acts in 1774, or the Intolerable Acts. Block they blockaded the port of Boston in an attempt to bring colonists to their knees and to obey the king's edicts. Instead, it rallied surrounding communities and other Americans. The colonies were called to a day of prayer and fasting. Thomas Jefferson called on the Virginia legislature, quote, the deplored divine interposition mm -hmm. to give us one heart and one mind firmly to oppose by all just and proper means every injury to American rights. There's a call for unity, mm -hmm. right? There's a call for, for unity. I'm going to talk about that in, in, in uh, the Second. hidden within all those taxes and tariffs and acts yeah. was a law that said any tree over a certain height could not be cut down and used by right. the colonists. Right. It could only be harvested and sent to England right. to be used as masts <laughs> right. for the king's exactly. ships. Exactly. Yep. Now that, that, <laughs> yeah, that was part of it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, so you know what happened now? The colonists started to say, you know, we, we need to do something. So they got together the first Continental Congress when, when they came together to figure out what they're going to do. There's actually another uh, Annapolis meeting in between, but this was the first Continental Congress. Now here's what's really important on this. The, uh, at 1774, it began with a two-hour prayer meeting led by Reverend Jacob Duche, an Anglican clergyman. He later turned against the colonials. His life ended in infamy, poor guy. John Adams wrote a letter to Abigail in which he reported, all right, so at the first Continental Congress meeting, they started the meeting with a two-hour meeting, wow. prayer meeting, all right? It wasn't a little, God, please please bless our meeting, and mm -hmm. then they go on to business. No, it was a two-hour prayer meeting, and John Adams wrote back to his wife Abigail and reported about it, and this is what he said. He said, I never saw a greater effect upon an audience 
It seemed as if heaven had ordained that psalm. They read Psalm 35. Mm -hmm. That psalm to be read on that morning. After this, Mr. Duche, unexpected to everybody, struck out into an extemporary prayer which filled the bosom of every man present. I must confess, I never heard a better prayer or one so well pronounced. Episcopalian as he is, Dr. Cooper himself never prayed with such fervor, such ardor, such earnestness and pathos, and in a language so elegant and sublime. For America, for the Congress, for the province of Massachusetts, Bay, and especially the town of Boston, it has had an excellent effect upon everybody here. And George Whitfield had prepared the atmosphere with his father Abraham's sermon that he preached along the East Coast. Let me explain what, what that was. Here you had 13 colonies coming together. We don't realize it. At that point, it wasn't just like 13 states. It was basically like 13 different countries because they were so different, all 13 colonies. A lot of them had different religions, different languages. They were settled by different people. They had their own economies. They had their own currency. They, they were basically like 13 different uh, countries, all trying to come together to come up with some sense of, of union. But it never would have happened except for George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, was, and we'll talk about this in, in a minute, during the Great Awakening, they went up and down the East Coast preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And preaching, regardless of what religion was dominant in that colony, he preached that we were all one in Jesus Christ. That's where the unity came. And that's where the unity came in the Continental Congress. That's why they could come together to pray. Uh, that, uh, actually, there were some objections to Some of the guys objected to, to praying during the Congress. But I think it was Sam Adams who said, uh, said I, I have no problem with anybody as long as they're willing to pray to the same God and for the same cause there. So, again, they understood their they unity, regardless of their uh, uh, religion. They had some that were Anglican, some that were Baptist, some that were Congregationalists. Some of that were different religions, but uh, that didn't matter as long as they were all Christians. That was their, their unity there, was, was in Christ. All right. Uh, in 1775, then, the colonies began to build a sense of unity and common cause. Patrick Henry, again, he said, said, now he got up before the, 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 uh, uh, the legislature, and basically this, this is what he said. This is like his, his famous speech. He said, sir that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be the next week or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed? How about Second Amendment? Amen? And will it be when we're totally disarmed and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs? and hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemies shall have bound us hand and foot. Sir, we are not weak if we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature has placed in our power. Three millions of people armed with the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable, and let it come. I repeat, sir, let it come. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet 
as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but for as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Mm -hmm. That was his speech. Now, it is powerful, and I've seen, I understand this, what was happening. They're going against the biggest army in the world at that time, the British Empire. The British Empire. And they're a bunch of ragtag colony farmers, and they don't know what the heck they're doing. But the point is this. <laughs> this, this speech is one of his famous speeches. I've seen it in a public school textbook without, without these three words. Forbid it, Almighty God. They just dot, 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 and they leave God out. They leave God out. That's what's going on in our public schools today. Because in their mind, they can't mix God with our American history, even though he was a part of American history. So we need to understand that this is God's story. Amen? I took a high school American history in, in the 60s, and I don't remember ever seeing that, and God forbid it. Yeah. In the 60s, it was already going. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, It really started in the 50s, where they started. With, actually, we'll talk more about that, even, even er, er, earlier than that. Okay, so then now the, the war is going on, and now we have the, the Battle of, of Lexington. About seven months after the First Continental Congress went in Philadelphia, Paul Revere set out in his famous ride toward the colonists, and in particular, two leaders of the rebellion, Sam Adams and John Hancock, that the British were coming. He knew precisely where to find them, at the home of Reverend Jonas Clark in Lexington. Reverend Clark had for some time been teaching his church and prominent men of Massachusetts biblical ideas of liberty. He had also prepared his parishioners to defend themselves if necessary. After being warned that British troops were on the way, he was asked if the people of Lexington would fight. He replied, quote, I have trained them for this very hour. The shot that was heard around the world took place on the morning of April 19, 1775. Fighting began on the lawn of Reverend Clark's church, and it was his parishioners who died that day. Upon seeing them slain, he declared, from this day will be dated the liberty of the world. So where did it start? It started in the church. It started in the church. God have mercy on the church today that doesn't want to get involved. Yeah. Yeah. We had liberty in this nation because of the church of Jesus Christ. It was the clergy who led the way. I get ticked off, but anyway. And it started out, I mean, again, we're taught that the British went out to seize the arms right. and, and thereby crushed the rebellion. That was only part two. Their main goal was to arrest yes. Samuel Adams and John right, Hancock exactly, right. and then seize the arms. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay, all right. So let's talk about just uh, some of the, the uh, 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 people that were involved there. Uh, about one month before the Battle of Lexington, the governor of Connecticut had considered what he and his state could do regarding the growing conflict between England and the colonies. Jonathan Trumbull was an ordained minister who had early in his career left the pulpit ministry to serve in civil ministry. As governor of Connecticut during the entire Revolutionary War, he provided great support to General Washington, who called him Brother Jonathan. In March 1775, his determined course of action was to call upon the colony to observe a day of public fasting and prayer. Hmm that God would graciously pour out His Holy Spirit on us to bring us to a thorough repentance and effectual reformation that He would restore, preserve, and secure the liberties of this and all the other American colonies and make this land a mountain of holiness and habitation of righteousness forever, that God would preserve and confirm the union of the colonies in the pursuit and practice of that religion and virtue which will honor him. I mean, this is, this is again, all original documentation. This is all what they said. That, that's the proof of, 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 of the whole, whole deal. All right? And then in 1776, they got together again. Uh, uh, 
to come up with a dec with the Declaration of Independence. The men who signed the Declaration of Independence were not thinking they would be famous, but rather they would most likely be killed for their action. After signing the document with usually large writing, the President of the Continental Congress, John Hancock, declared, His Majesty can now read my name without glasses, and he can also double the price on my head. Then he went on to say at that tense moment, we must be unanimous, there must be no pulling in different ways. We must all hang together. Benjamin Franklin responded in his characteristic wit, yes, we must indeed all hang together, or most assuredly, we'll hang separately. <laughs> all right, that's the whole, the whole key now. I don't understand what, what, what happened. That, I don't know if I said that at this point, but uh, uh, not. Well, let me just, just, just say at this point. They, they said that, that at the signing of the Declaration, it was, there was, it was such a somber thing that, uh, that, that each man went up and signed his name on, on the Declaration without a sound. They said the only speech that went up then at that point was when uh, George Harrison, who was a big, big guy, uh, he, he, he said to Elbridge Jerry from Connecticut, who was a small guy, maybe like me, whatever, but, but he said to Elbridge J J Jerry, he said, he said, at least when they hang me, I'll die like that. But when they hang you, you're probably going to be swinging around there for hours before you finally die. Oh, shoot. But that's what they talked about. They talked about how they were going to die. Because they knew that the odds were against them. And, and once they got caught, they were going to be executed. So that's what they talked about. Yeah. You talk about that they, they committed their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor. They gave everything that they had for us. Amen. And that's what we have to realize. These men gave everything they had because mm -hmm. they knew that God gave everything he had for them. Mm -hmm. And they were simply doing the same thing. So we, we, need, we need to understand what's going on. But John Adams said at the, at the end of the signing... He said, he wrote a letter to his wife, Abigail, and he said to her in the letter, he said, the second day of July 1776 will be the most memorable epoch in American history. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as a great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated, listen to this, as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God. You didn't know John Adams had a deliverance ministry, mm -hmm. right? By solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty, it ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bell fires, bonfires, illuminations, from one end of the continent to the other, from this time forevermore. Mm. You talk about prophecy. Mm -hmm. Wasn't he being prophetic? Isn't that what we do the 4th of July every year? Yeah. You know, with, with everything more. Why? Because we've been delivered from the hands of Satan. You know, that's what his whole thing. He said, you will think me transported with enthusiasm. Anybody know what the word enthusiasm literally comes from? The, the root word of enthusiasm? It comes from two Greek words. En, which means in, and enthusiasm is, comes from the word theosism. Theos is the Greek for God. So enthusiasm literally means in theosism, in Godism. The idea is that if you're in God, you will be enthused. That's why I said there should be no such thing as a bored Christian. You know, if, if you're a Christian, you should be enthused because you're in God. You're in Theos. You should be enthused. Amen? All right. That was the next one. Okay, you will uh, think of training enthusiasm. Uh, yet through all the gloom, I can see the rays of light and glory. I can see that the end is worth more than all the means, even though... We may regret it, which I trust in God, we shall not. All right, that's what he said. The whole thing was about God. The whole thing was about God. All right, moving right along. All right, so what was the importance of the Bible? I got to, well, we went past, uh, okay. Well, we'll do the best we can. All right, moving past. Right, what Bible? Uh, in the book, The Bible of the Revolution, Robert Dearden Douglas Watson wrote this. He said, Revolutionary America without Bibles presented an impossible situation. In no country in the world was the good book then so relied upon. Faith in divine providence and the consolation and the guidance of the Holy Writ were necessary to all patriots in the struggle for liberty. Before the rapture, before the 
the rupture with the mother country, the colonies had depended largely for their literature upon England, and entirely so for their Bibles in their native tongue. The Revolutionary War stopped importation, and at length the situation reached such an active, acute stage that the chaplain of Congress, Reverend Patrick Allison, placed before that body a petition praying for immediate relief. The memorial was assigned to a special committee which weighed the matter with great care, and on September 11, 1777, it reported this, that the use of the Bible is so universal and its importance so great that your committee refer the above to the consideration of Congress, and if Congress shall not think it expedient to order the importation of types and paper, the committee recommend that Congress will order the Committee of Congress to import 20,000 Bibles from Holland, Scotland, or elsewhere into the different parts of the State of the Union. Whereupon it was resolved accordingly to direct said committee to import 20,000 copies of the Bible. All right, so in other words, they remember the king didn't allow them to print their own Bible, so they had to import all their Bibles from England. Now there was war with England, so now they couldn't get Bibles from England. Now they were stuck. They said, we can't go on without Bibles. So the Congress at that point issued a, a, a directive to order 20,000 Bibles from Holland or wherever they, 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 they could get them. The reality was they didn't get it from there. They ended up printing their own Bibles here, which is called the, the Atkins Bible, uh, which is the first Bible that was printed in the United States in the English language. Uh, and, 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 and I don't know if that's what, is that what that is, the Aiken Bible, but the Aiken Bible, A-I-T-K-E-N uh, Bible was, was printed here in the United States. But the point is that they felt they couldn't go on with the war without the Bible. They needed Bibles, and mm -hmm. they ordered 20,000 Bibles. I mean, what, what do you think would happen if somebody in Congress today <laughs> made, passed a resolution or, or introduced a bill to order Bibles for Americans? What do you think would happen? At least. Mm -hmm. But that's the foundation of this country. Yeah. That's the foundation of this country. Amen. All right. Okay. So for that, let's take a break. Coffee's rare.